study guide today a number of different kinds of proverbs that appear. I'm not saying this is all of them by any means, and we're not going to be able to cover them all. We're picking out one of them today, one particular type that we're going to be uh, looking at. Uh, but we have uh, some of the proverbs uh, are what we might call instruction proverbs because a typical statement that will appear in them is something like, listen, my son. And we noticed when we first started studying the Proverbs that they seem to be directed uh, to a son. And of course, if they're the Proverbs of Solomon, then we would have uh, one of his sons, I suppose. Uh, Solomon attempting to give him an education to prepare for uh, royalty, to prepare to actually rule. Uh, of course, apparently Rehoboam didn't read them, I guess, because as it all turned out, uh, he turned out to be a pretty lousy king. But at least he had the opportunity. It was there. Maybe we can learn something from, from the Proverbs. Now, I'm not saying that Proverbs 1 through 9 and Proverbs 22 through 24 all began with the phrase, listen, my son. But if you'll look at them, just kind of glance through them, you'll notice repeatedly uh, verses that will say something like, uh, listen, my son, or my son. So... Um, it characterizes it, those particular proverbs as instruction to a son. And then number two, there are proverbs that we might call admonitions, uh, like Proverbs 4.23, which says, guard your heart for it is, you know, and so forth. You'll see those admonishing the reader uh, to do something. And then number three, which is what we're going to look at today, they're very interesting to me, numerical sayings in the book of Psalms where it will say, as today's text will say, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, they're not always six and seven. There are sometimes other numbers, but we'll be looking at those here today. And then uh, number four, we have sayings that we can categorize as better than sayings. One thing is better than something else. And uh, in this particular case, Proverbs 19 and 1 talks about better are the poor than the rich and it goes on to explain that you may have a real question how could that possibly be that it's better to be poor than rich but you have to kind of look at that proverb to see what's going on there and then we have these comparative sayings as in proverbs chapter 30 verse 33 which reads for as churning milk produces butter and it goes on to talk about something else comparing it to this churning of milk producing butter and then there's a number of, number six, a number of abomination sayings, like uh, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 9. You'll find a number of those in the book of Proverbs. Then we have what we could call Beatitudes, like the Beatitudes of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll find those in Proverbs too, as in Proverbs 22 and verse 9, blessed is the one who is kind to the poor, and so forth. Number eight, we might categorize as Yahweh sayings, uh, which of course is the Hebrew word translated uh, Lord, especially when you see it in all capital letters, like uh, Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked. And then uh, number nine we have here, we've, in fact, we've looked at this one, the contrary Proverbs, where one thing is contrary to another, as we have in Proverbs uh, 26, verses four and five, answer not a fool, then it turns right around and says, answer a fool. So those are contrary sayings. And number 10, we have the acrostics. And that's also really interesting, where we have a series of verses where each verse will begin uh, with a word with the same letter. Uh, well, with, I'm sorry, with succeeding letters, starting with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and then working its way down, as it does in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, working its way down through all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet with each verse starting with a succeeding letter. So the structure like this always interests me uh, because for one thing, it's a sign of intelligent life in the Bible. <laughs> when you have verses beginning actually alphabetically, that's obviously intentional. Or when you have um, uh, even today, like these numerical sayings, you know, that didn't just happen by accident. Of course, we believe it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it means the author is very intentional in the way he structures uh, something. So when we see that, we want to pay real attention to that and get what the overall message is. So today, we're going to be looking uh, at one of these numerical lists, and that's uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. Uh, we would just call it a list of things that God hates. 
It, it reads this way uh, in, in this text. I've got it printed out for you here in the study guide. These six things the Lord hates. But the list turns out to have seven things in it. And so it reads, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, when you see something like that, yes, there's seven things in the list, but it looks like there's a real emphasis on that seventh thing. In other words, it doesn't just say there's seven things God hates. It says there's six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And here's what they are. A proud look. We'll let some of these things sink in. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. Notice that doesn't just say a liar. We've taken care of the liar back up earlier in the list when it says he hates a proud look and a lying tongue. But now it says a false witness who speaks lies. And then the one who sows discord among brethren is the seventh thing on the list. That's kind of saved till the last. So there's six things that God hates. Yes, there are seven that are an abomination to him. That word abomination, I guess maybe we use that some today in our conversations. But the Hebrew word that's translated abomination, which is toivah, is a word that means here's something that is detestable to God. He detests this. And so he really does detest it when people sow discord among brethren, which is a very common sin. We'll get to that here this morning. We had some, something, all of these things we want to avoid. But unfortunately, when there are groups of people who get together and who know each other, it's pretty common to feel like, well, I remember sitting down to eat at a restaurant somewhere with a friend of mine. And of course he was just joking, but um, when he would pray over the food, he would say something like this, now God bless the people that we'll talk about. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we we're gonna say good things about them, but it's so common, isn't it, that the main focus of many conversations that we have, that focus is about other people. Okay. And we're not always saying nice things about them. So let's talk first of all about pride. The Bible says in this particular text, God hates a proud look. What is pride? I suppose that you could look in a dictionary, get some idea of what pride is. But as we look at the text of scripture about pride, it seems that the whole issue with pride is that it's an exaltation of oneself above, above other people, or even above God, as we'll see here in just a moment. Uh, I know we use the word proud in a positive way many times. I'm proud of you, and that's, you know, I don't really think that's the problem here. The problem with pride is self-exaltation. And so it is apparently the original sin of Lucifer. If we understand uh, what scripture is saying about Satan, by the way, the word Satan is just a Hebrew word, Satan. It's a Hebrew word that means adversary. And so sometimes we read Lucifer as we're going to in a couple of texts here today. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 14. If you wanna turn there with me, Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll start reading at verse 12. We'll read down a few verses here, Isaiah chapter 14, and starting at verse 12, and we'll read down through verse 16. Isaiah 14 and 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now here's where we can especially see pride coming to play. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So here's Lucifer saying, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God. Verse 15 reads, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, which is in the King James translated hell. You'll be brought down to hell to the lowest depths of the pit. So Lucifer's ambition here was certainly self-exaltation, promoting himself. I suppose we could say he was the original self-promoter. I don't know how many banners he had printed up with his face on them. No, no, but he was a great one to promote himself. And that resulted, of course, in him being cast down. And then we have another text that we believe is also speaking about uh, this situation. And that's Ezekiel, if you will turn there, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19. Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. This is an interesting chapter, too, because it speaks, first of all, in verse 2 of Ezekiel 28 about the prince of Tyre. Tyre, of course, was a city, so there's someone that's the prince of Tyre. But then if you go down to verse 12, where we're going to read from here today, now it speaks about the king of Tyre. And we've got two different things going on here. A prince would be the human prince, but this king of Tyre is someone we'll see in this text who was created. Now, a human being, except for Adam and Eve, is not created. But this king of Tyre was a created being. We believe this is a reference to the one that now is typically called Satan or Lucifer. So here in Ezekiel chapter 28, we'll start reading in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now, there weren't too many people in Eden, if you remember. There was Adam. There was Eve. But whoever this is, this king of Tyre, was in Eden. I wonder who that could have been. The only other being we know of who was in Eden was the serpent. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, the emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So this is a created being. We know that angels are created by God. And then verse 14, you were the anointed cherub. Well, that cherub is an angel. And so you were the anointed cherub who covers I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, sometimes we ask, well, where does sin, where does iniquity begin? Well, it seems to be it begins with this person right here. Till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, in the, from the midst of the fiery stones. And here we are. Your heart was lifted up. The Hebrew word translated lifted up there means something like proud. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You know, we have these images of Satan with, you know, wearing a red suit with a pitchfork and a long tail and horns and all that. Doesn't sound like a description uh, that we're reading here. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze on you and so forth. Now, there's a whole lot there that we can't take the time to discuss today. But you do see the problem. With this king of Tyre, it was pride, self-exaltation, a desire to be above God, better than God. And so wherever we see pride, 
we really see, to be blunt about it, Satan at work. I really think that pride is the root sin. I think it's the beginning, really, of all sin. You know, John talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if we really worked on it, I think we could probably, probably categorize every sin in existence under one of those three subheadings. It's either the lust of the flesh, by the way, lust means strong desires, or the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. And I think that the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes probably both spring from the pride of life. So um, we have plenty of scriptures that tell us something about the problem of pride, and I'm going to ask if maybe we could have a couple of you, uh, maybe three of you, read some of these verses here. So, uh, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2 would be the first one. Who'll take that for me? Okay, thank you, Patrick. Proverbs 11 and 2, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10. All right, thank you. And uh, Proverbs 16, verse 18. Who will do that? Proverbs 16 and 18. Thank you, Brother Larson. And Proverbs 21 and verse 4. Who will do that? Thank you, Brother Norris. So let's start with um, the book of Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2. When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. You know, one of the things you see consistently in Scripture is humility exalted to being a desirable virtue. Jesus tells us, you know, if you're invited to a feast, take the low seat. Don't go in and say, ah, the high seat is still empty. I'll take that. Because he says the only place you can go from that high seat is down. <laughs> take the low seat. If the host wants to exalt you, he can do that. We're talking about customs, of course, from the first century. But, but to start with humility rather than with arrogance and pride and self-exaltation, Read that one more time for us. When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. A consequence of pride ultimately is going to be shame. But those who are humble are wise people. And then we have uh, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice with wisdom. Okay. And what translation is that? Just so. ESV, okay. So insolence probably is what's being represented there as pride. So read that for us one more time. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice with wisdom. Those who take advice, they're wise people. Isn't that great? Uh, this sounds like, well, that's just common sense. Yeah, but this is inspired common sense that we're reading in Scripture. So it's a wise thing to take advice, but to be insolent? What does it say is the consequence of insolence there again? Nothing but strife. Nothing but strife comes from insolence, or we could say pride and arrogance and so forth. And then we have Proverbs 13, I'm sorry, Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. Pride goeth before destruction. So where there's pride, the destruction is coming. And a haughty spirit, that leads to a fall. Now, this pride problem is a really, it's really a deep-rooted thing in us. All of us want to be respected, right? That's a big cry that we have in our culture today. We want to be respected. Not quite so sure we want to respect others, but we want to be respected, and we get really disturbed and upset if we're not. There's probably a little root of pride in that. I'm not saying it's bad to, to you know, be a respectable person. That's good. But... Any of these good virtues can be taken to some extreme that's not so good. And so we have one more verse here, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 4, Brother Norris. The haughty look, the proud heart, and the power of the wisdom It's a sin. So that, you know, this verse just brings it right down to the bottom line. Pride is a sin. So we have to avoid that. God hates pride. And then the next thing in the list here is he also hates a lying tongue. So if we take a look at, um, somebody read John 8.44 for us. Who's going to do John 8.44? John 8.44. Jesus said, 
John, the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 44. Who will do that? Thank you, Patrick. And then we have a couple of verses in Revelation, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Who will do that for us? Revelation, okay, uh, Michael. And also, Michael, you're going to be close there to Revelation 22, 15. Maybe you could get that one as well. Okay, so uh, obviously we can look at lots of verses in the Bible about lying and liars, but I've just selected some here. John chapter 8 and verse 44. You are of your father, the devil. On the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie... He speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And this is specifically talking about the devil. And among other things, it says he is a liar and he is the father of the whole idea of lying. He's a deceiver. And so to lie is characteristic of Satan. That's one of the reasons we want to avoid lying. And we want to speak the truth. And then we have, I've just pointed out here that there is a destiny for those who practice lying. Now, obviously, we can ask God to forgive us, and God will do that. But for those who persist in a life of lying, there's a destiny. And the first of all, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, abominable and murderer, and whoremonger, and sorcerer, and idolaters, and all liars, and we thank you Michael and we have an earlier verse that talks about uh, the devil being cast into the lake of fire so those who practice lying their destiny is to be in the lake of fire as Satan will be but uh, there's a whole list there of characteristics of people who will be in that place uh, obviously, if they're in the lake of fire, they're not going to be in the New Jerusalem as Revelation 22 and 15. If you want to read that for us, Michael. It says, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Okay, so outside of the city uh, are all of the folks who have practiced these things. But notice here, it's a little different. It says, Whoever loves and makes a lie. So I think. Perhaps we can make a distinction between just telling a lie. You can tell a lie. But in addition to that, you can also make a lie. You can make something appear to be true that is not true. You may not say anything with your mouth, possibly, but there are appearances. And you can manipulate events and situations and so forth so that something appears to be true that is not. And those people are also going to be outside of the New Jerusalem. So we want to embrace truth-telling. We want to embrace humility and not pride. These are good characteristics for us to aim for. And then the third thing that the scripture mentions that God hates is hands that shed innocent blood. I would say it's a warning against violence, but notice specifically against innocent blood. God abhors murder. But you know, on the other hand, I don't know if you're reading your Bible through this year. Susan and I are reading through this year uh, in the ESV, and it's really interesting uh, to do that, but it makes everything quite clear. And sometimes we'll be reading because we're reading kind of together, you know, each day reading the same thing. We just got finished reading through the book of Judges. Oh, oh. I've often said that book should be rated at least R. It might even be... I mean, it would be an inspired hour, but still, that book of Judges, oh my. And um, you know, you've got plenty of murder going on there and all kinds of things. I would you know, make today's news seem pretty tame, really, if you read the book of, of Judges. But um, sometimes we, you know, we look at all these stories about how God commands the Israelites, for example, to kill everybody when they go into the Promised Land. Not just the men, but the women and the children. And it just looks horrid, and it is horrid. But you also have to kind of read between the lines there because what you've got going on is um, God using human beings to deal with the consequences of stubborn, long-term, rebellious sin against him by others. 
uh, he, he uses Israel, for example, as punishment for the people in the land of Canaan uh, because of their ongoing horrible sins. Some things we don't even necessarily read about in Scripture, but they're there. Sacrificing your children, of course we do read references to that, but just you know, all kinds of idolatry and so forth. But then later on, God also uses Babylon, for example, to punish Israel for their sins. Makes it very clear. Jeremiah will say repeatedly, this is because of your sins. But read the book of Lamentations and you'll see that. So God does do that. But what you see here is hands that shed innocent blood. In other words, these folks, these rebels and so forth, they're certainly not innocent. But this is innocent blood that God hates to see shed here. Um, for example, in one place, he tells Abraham, you know, the reason you're not going to inherit the land right now is because the cup of the Amorites' iniquity is not yet full. In other words, God was continuing to give them an opportunity to repent and to respond, but they didn't. And then, uh, and then they did experience the judgment of God through the invasion of the people of Israel. We even have in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, a reference to capital punishment. If you want to take a quick look at that, Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. And uh, this uh, is after Noah's flood. And uh, the scripture reads, Surely for your life blood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. From the hand of man. Uh, for the, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he has made man. So to attack a human being is to attack the image of God. This is one of the reasons why God hates that. And I, you know, I want to say specifically too about the hands that shed innocent blood. That really speaks to the issue of abortion because we have innocent human beings here in a mother's womb who have no awareness at all of sin or certainly not of any idea of rebellion against God. And um, that's a sin that's ongoing, not just in our society, but in the world today. God hates that. And then he also hates wicked thoughts and plans. If you, um, if you looked at the human ability to imagine, God has given us a fabulous skill at imagination, visualization, creativity, uh, but... I was just thinking about the dreams that my wife and my mother both told me this morning that they had. <laughs> I kind of saw a connection between them. And, uh, and the dream is just, a, I'm just using that as an illustration of how creative we can be. I don't really understand how dreams work, but however they work, Susan said this morning when she woke up, I had this dream. She said, I dreamed I was on a bus. And I was going somewhere and, and uh, turned around to talk to somebody and suddenly everybody else was gone. I said, I couldn't find you. Then went over to pick up my mother and she, one of the first things she told me when I walked into her room this morning is, I had a nightmare last night, she said. She said, I dreamed you were telling me that I had three brothers. And I kept telling you, well, I don't have three brothers. Yeah, mom had two brothers, but she said, I kept telling you, I don't have three brothers. And uh, then Susan said, you know, I couldn't find you in my dream. I said, well, I was over telling mom that she had three brothers. That's, that's, a, that's a reason for that. But uh, <laughs> we, have, we have this amazing ability to imagine. Well, God gave us that, but on the other hand, he hates it when we use that ability to create and to think and to visualize and to imagine when we use that to devise wicked plans, which so often happens. That's using a gift that God has given us in rebellion against God. 
And uh, in, the, in the days of Noah, this is exactly what was going on. Their hearts were on wicked imaginations continually. Genesis ch chapter 6 and verse 5. So this is one of the reasons why God destroyed nearly the entire human population in the days of Noah. Wicked imaginations. Do we see any of that going on in our world today? Oh, yes. And it's not just here in the good old U.S. of A. It's a universal problem with fallen human beings. And so, uh, in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 30, in fact, Romans chapter 1 and verse 30, Paul even talks about this. Let's take a look at it. Romans 1 and 30. Paul is listing here, we read this a uh, couple of Sundays ago, Paul is listing the kinds of sins that are typical of those who rebel against God. And in verse 30 of Romans 1, he says, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. And then disobedient to parents. We might look at that disobedience to parents as kind of a minimal sort of a thing, but it's listed right there with some really significant sins. And so the Lord hates that. Using the ability he's given us to invent, to create in an evil way. These are things that God hates. Wicked thoughts, wicked plans. But now we're down to the last two. God hates those who give false witness. And he hates those who are involved in sowing discord. So what is this about false witness? We're not just talking about your common, run-of-the-mill, ordinary lying here. We're talking about being a false witness against someone. Claiming that you have seen someone do something that you really didn't see them do. Or misrepresenting what you saw done. So if you looked at the ninth of the Ten Commandments, and you can read it if you want in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16, that ninth commandment specifically prohibits the bearing of false witness against your neighbor. Again, it's the whole idea of saying that your neighbor is guilty of something that your neighbor is not guilty of. God hates that. Um, if you looked in the law of Moses, for example, you could look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, verses 6 and 7. If you look there, you would discover that to protect the innocent under the law of Moses, one witness was never sufficient to condemn a person to death. You couldn't do it under the law of Moses. Even if somebody says, I saw him do it, that wasn't enough. Because anybody could claim to have seen someone do something. But you had to have at least two witnesses. Now, this means eyewitnesses. This is not hearsay. You had to have at least two people and preferably three who would affirm that a particular person was guilty of something. They knew they were guilty of it. They saw them do it. And their stories had to match. I heard a story years ago about four guys in high school decided they were going to play hooky. If you know what hooky still means. I don't know if they still use that word or not. But anyway, they were going to drop out of school for the day. So they all, you know, got in the car and went somewhere. And were very, very late getting back to school. And their excuse to the teacher was they all agreed among themselves. We will tell the teacher we had a flat tire. So they did that. It all went up in smoke, though, when the teacher asked them individually and privately, which tire was flat? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, crime doesn't pay. You never can really think through all the details enough to really be sure that you're not going to be caught. Well, it's easy for a person to, to, if they have something against another person, to claim some evil the other person has done. But you had to have at least two preferably three witnesses who would affirm the same uh, behavior or activity. And uh, that was a protection of innocent people. But then even beyond that, the accusers who were giving this witness 
had not only to agree, you remember in the New Testament that there were false witnesses who came against Jesus, but they didn't all agree in their witness. But still, of course, he was crucified. But these, in the Old Testament, these accusers not only had to agree, but then they also had to be the very first. They had to lay their hands on the head of that person they were accusing, look them in the eyes, and affirm they saw them do this. Now, if you hadn't, it, well, that would be pretty tough to do. But then you also had to be the first ones to cast the stones to put them to death. So these were all kind of safeguards against false witnesses. Um, and so uh, they, these, these safeguards kind of gave these accusers at least an opportunity to rethink their false witness maybe to reconsider, to have a maximum opportunity to reverse their testimony. Because only the most calloused and hard person, I would think, could go through all of this, making the false witness, putting, actually coming in physical co contact with the person that they were accusing, actually casting the first stone. And so it was to spare a uh, really innocent life. God hates when there's a false witness. If you're gonna say something about somebody, be sure what you say is absolutely true. But probably the old adage, I don't know that we can actually find this in the chapter and verse, but the old adage, if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all, that's probably a good safety valve there. But then finally, we have he who sows discord among brethren. Can I tell you, it is better to err on the side of mercy than on the side of judgment. Even if you have seen someone do something that seems to affix blame to that person, be cautious because, as the great theologian Louis L'Amour said, things are not always as they seem. <laughs> you may see someone do something, but you're not really sure why that person did that, what the motivation was. You can't read his mind. So it's good, it's good to be on the side of mercy and you can always misinterpret what you've seen and what you've heard. I'm just thinking about a particular event in my life when I was called upon really to investigate a situation. And it was a real challenge to know what to do. I was called actually with another minister to investigate it situation. And uh, we wanted to be sure that we made the right decision, the right recommendation. And it seemed like the Lord brought back to my mind the verse, against an elder do not receive an accusation except before two or three witnesses, which is obvious. That was Paul saying that, but that's from the Old Testament. And I realized there's only one witness here. That's it. The elder says this never happened. One person says it did. So I told my compatriot who was charged with this with me, uh, charged with doing this with me, I said, really, we, we, we only have one choice here because we have a Bible verse that tells us against an elder do not receive a witness unless there are at least two or three witnesses. So the decision was already made for us by the Apostle Paul. I took great comfort in that. We at least had a biblical verse to stand on. But then this sowing discord among brethren. That's the seventh thing, and it kind of labels the rest of them as abominations. And uh, the one that he seems to hate most, all of these are awful and God hates them all, but he really hates this one. Because um, it's God's desire that we walk together in harmony and unity and oneness of spirit. Remember on the day of Pentecost, they were in one mind and one accord. If somebody had been there sowing discord, that would have perhaps you know, prevented the whole wonderful event of the day of Pentecost from happening. We need to be in one mind and one accord. And so uh, the most common way that we sow discord is when one person tells another person something that's harmful to the reputation of somebody, it may even be true, but if you tell someone something that's harmful to another person's reputation, uh, 
If that person has no need to hear it, no reason for them to know this, or no authority to do anything about it, that's sowing discord. I've given you several verses here. We're not going to have the time to look at all of them. Galatians 5.20, 2 Thessalonians 3.11, 1 Timothy 5.13, 1 Peter 4.15. All of these say something about this kind of sin that would divide people and sow discord among people and lead to all kinds of undesirable and ungodly results. So this has been, you know, kind of a negative lesson today. I realize that, but I also realize that probably all of us are guilty of all seven of these things at some time in life. So in our prayers, we want to ask God to forgive us for our sins. And we want to ask God to help us not to practice this kind of behavior. But instead, as Jesus said, you know, there's really two commandments that are the greatest. The first one is love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And if we practice that, we're not going to have any problem with these seven sins. And isn't that good news? <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for coming today. We'll see you next week.